The United Arab Emirates accused of helping to boost Islamophobia in Britain. A media watchdog says the Emiratis mobilized opinion in the highest echelons of the British government against the Muslim Brotherhood. What are the limits of political lobbying in the UK? This is Inside Story. Hello there and welcome to the programme. I'm Laura Kyle. The United Arab Emirates is being accused of helping promote Islamophobia in the UK. The British media watchdog Spinwatch says the UAE spent millions of dollars to influence political decision making. And the watchdog says the Emiratis pressured journalists and think tanks, all aimed at influencing the British government against the Muslim Brotherhood. Spinwatch says it has leaked emails showing how the Emiratis were involved in what's described as clandestine lobbying tactics in both Britain and the US. And it highlights the UAE's campaign against Qatar and the 2022 World Cup. The UAE, along with Saudi Arabia, Bahrain and Egypt, cut diplomatic ties with Qatar 13 months ago and imposed an economic blockade. We'll get to our guests shortly. But first, here's more from Paul Brennan in London. The 2011 Arab Spring saw a wave of democratic grassroots protests which toppled longtime leaders and offered the hope of a new vision for the Middle East. The response by some of the kingdoms and emirates of the region was just as dramatic. A report by the Spinwatch Group says that in the UK, the United Arab Emirates mobilized a narrative against the Muslim Brotherhood in Britain in the highest echelons of government. It says the Abu Dhabi Crown Prince and the then Prime Minister David Cameron had several undeclared meetings. And it says through a combination of persuasion and threats, the UAE campaign produced results. One uh, threat which was made by the UAE to David Cameron was if you don't institute an inquiry into the Muslim Brotherhood, we will cancel the Typhoon fighter jet deal from British Aerospace and we will stop British Petroleum getting an oil concession in the UAE. Now that was successful, I mean an extraordinary effort by the UAE to actually cajole and bully the British government into uh, pursuing its foreign policy. The success or failure of the other UAE lobbying is less clear. Spinwatch says that the UAE put pressure on the BBC over its coverage of the Arab Spring, but the BBC in a statement has flatly denied that it caved in to any political pressure. Spinwatch also quotes a source suggesting that Emirati donations to the think tank Chatham House may have affected that institute's research. But Chatham House has vigorously denied that it could be affected in that way. But the UAE foreign minister is known to have had close contacts with selected UK journalists, meetings which led the UAE's PR firm Quilla to claim that views changed. And the report highlights the ways the 2017 blockade against Qatar saw the intensification of the UAE's PR campaign, including bitter criticism of Qatar's 2022 World Cup. The lobbying rules are woefully inadequate, it seems to me, and uh, there needs to be much greater safeguards to you know, prevent the sort of uh, influence which seems to have been uh, exerted on the, on the British government in the way in which it has been. And of course, you know, some of the unintended consequences have been the growth of Islamophobia in this country, and we're seeing the uh, expression of that on, on the streets of Britain. The report notes that now Theresa May is UK Prime Minister, Abu Dhabi's clout has diminished significantly but there seems little to prevent a possible slide backwards. The central issue in all of this is one of transparency. When does legitimate lobbying become undue influence? And to quote the report itself, promising billions in return for influence, infiltrating the British media, buying politicians loyalty, donating to think tanks and trying to influence media coverage, some would see as a step too far. Paul Brennan, Al Jazeera, Central London. Let's now bring in our panel and joining us from London, Afzal Ashraf, visiting fellow at Nottingham University. From Bristol, David Miller, founder of Spinwatch. And also from London, Kevin Craig, CEO of PLMR, that's Political Lobbying and Media Relations. A very warm welcome to all of you. David, if I can just start with you, talk us through, for you, what were the key findings of your report? Well, the key thing about this report, we've done many reports in the past on elite groups encouraging Islamophobia, but the key thing about this report was we'd able, we were able to get uh, leaked to us the internal um, emails between Quiller 
and some of the UAE uh, handlers. And that was really quite dramatic because it allowed us to see not just a specific question of transparency or lack of transparency or a specific um, uh, area of activity, but it allowed us to see the overall strategy which they were adopting. And that strategy was really quite wide-ranging, as you heard in the report there. Yes, they were trying to influence think tanks by funding them and trying to manage who was uh, employed there. Yes, they were trying to influence the BBC by trying to manage who was reporting from uh, BBC Arabic. Yes, they were trying to influence journalists by briefing them secretly and then giving them information uh, about uh, opposition groups and about Qatar. Uh, but they were also uh, engaging directly with Westminster and Whitehall, with the, secretly with the Prime Minister, uh, with uh, Tory MPs, with the Foreign Affairs Committee people, with the all-party parliamentary group, splashing money on trips uh, to five-star hotels and to, to the Gulf. So we, we were able to see a really wide-ranging uh, lobbying campaign uh, before we even talk about the particular things which they might have got up to right. uh, in that campaign. Okay, so these emails, just to be clear here, are new to you because some have looked at this report and said there's nothing new in it, that it's just a rehash of an old report back in 2015. Well, if they've looked at the report and concluded that, they haven't read the report properly right. because the okay. material we have got uh, uh, in the report is not uh, uh, rehashed, it's new. Okay. And uh, Krebin, what, what do you make of the report? What, what's your conclusion that you've drawn from it? Well, uh, for, just for, for the record, because it's been so fast moving, I haven't been able to read every single page and, and wouldn't claim to, but I have read the summaries and I do actually think that uh, David's organisation play a, a valuable role in discussions around lobbying and transparency in, in Britain and beyond. But I am as the founder and chief executive of one of the UK's uh, leading lobbying firms, I'm unsurprised by a lot of the content of it. It is not shocking to me that uh, Gulf states seek to maximise their relationships with uh, foreign governments. Uh, I am very sceptical of the suggestion that the BBC, who we deal with, who is up there with, in terms of top tier media, as is Al Jazeera, that you can uh, influence the BBC. They're taking phone calls from people of all opinions, left, right and centre, all the time. Uh, so I'm very sceptical about the impact, whatever the consultants claimed. And I would say that I think there is uh, scrutiny is, is a very important thing. But in the UK, um, since 2014, we've had a lobbying register. We were the first to sign it, which means you have to declare every meeting that happens with ministers. Where I think there is an interesting area of debate, which Spinwatch have uh, uncovered here, is that uh, some of these meetings haven't been declared and perhaps people weren't that aware of how many times the Prime Minister of the day was meeting with a particular government. But none of that shocks me because in global diplomacy people want to push their own agenda all the time. OK, there's a couple of points I certainly want to pick up on there as the discussion unfolds. Just firstly, I do want to pick up on that uh, point that you made, Kevin, about the me about media, the, the BBC and, and Chatham House. And I do feel it's important to say that even again today, uh, members of Chatham House strenuously denied to our team that there had been any influenced by the UAE within their think tank. So do you think perhaps, David, that the, the reporters rather overplayed that aspect of this story? No, no not at all. I mean, this is, this is interesting, isn't it? I mean, the, the, the idea that the BBC is in, invulnerable to pressure is manifestly ridiculous. The BBC has been vulnerable to pressure from powerful institutions and organisations from the very beginning. Um, the particular claims that we make in the, the report, we're very, we're very careful not to overemphasise uh, the claims that we make, and that's the case with the BBC, but also with, with Chatham House. We know that, uh, that uh, Quiller uh, produced briefings uh, to target particular officials in Chatham House. We know that there was an attempt to uh, influence the kind of people who were there. We don't say that, the, that those attempts were successful, but we do note that two of the people who were targeted no longer have positions there. We're not making any claim that there was a causal relationship between the two of those. So we're being very clear what it is that we're, we're suggesting. Okay. That we, we have evidence that these people were targeted. We do not have evidence that they that causally that, that was related to them no longer having positions. Okay. Uh, on the question <clears throat> of transparency, yes, I think it's correct to say that there are meetings which are not... Um, disclosed and declared and the, 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 that that should be looked at in terms of lobbying legislation. But the problem goes far wider than that, as our lobbyist friend knows. The, the, the lobbying legislation that we have is pathetic. It requires lobbyists Absolutely. to no, we're disclose going to get when on they to that. directly Just a little later contact in the discussion. Minister, I promise you, we will be uh, looking very deeply at that. Okay. That's a key part of this discussion. Before we do, I just want to pick up right. on one point that you made there, that 
essentially UAE was perhaps unsuccessful in lobbying or trying to lobby the BBC and Chatham House, and there was no evidence that they had. Afsal, what's the UAE's aim here, and where was it successful? Well, I think the UAE's aim is no different from the aim of any other country. And this is one point I think this report uh, perhaps uh, hasn't made as well as it could have done. And that is that the behaviour of the UAE uh, is in line with the behaviour of every country, including the UK. Influence is at the heart of politics. What we are seeing here is the UAE um, acting in its own interest. Its interest in this particular instance was presumably uh, that uh, the Muslim Brotherhood represented a threat to security and stability in the region and particularly to them. And that was the agenda that they were pushing. Um, whether we agree with that agenda or not is irrelevant. The fact is that that is what they believed and they were using all the levers of influence they have in a way that is no different from the way that the UK, uh, the USA and other countries uh, uh, deploy it. I think the question here is when does that influence become um, malign? When mm. is it in, uh, in conflict with the interests of uh, a country such as the UK in this instance? Um, and, and I think that is where we should concentrate and that is where we should uh, uh, exploit the report, uh, its positive aspects in generating the debate. Uh, but I think the implication there that, and I don't want to be seen to be defending the UAE, I don't agree with uh, some of its foreign policy at all. Uh, but in this instance, I think it would be wrong to suggest that the UAE uh, was acting in any way that is different from other countries. Absolutely. And if the UAE had come on the show, we did ask them, they, they did not want to appear, they would say exactly that, that everyone's at it. Uh, Kevin, at what point, let's talk about this, at what point does lobbying become unacceptable? I think it becomes uh, unacceptable when it verges into corruption. And, and by the way, what a mistake by the UAE not to take up the, the opportunity to take part in today's, today's discussion. That was a real silly thing. But it becomes malign when it, it veers into corruption. And I think, you know, uh, one of the other... David, I think, said that legislation in this country is pathetic. But actually, I think it's remarkable uh, that we can find out so much about what does go on. If I want to find out what the Mayor of London's had for breakfast, First, he has to declare it if it's an external meeting. And there are those trips that we talked about at the UAE where they attempted to make friends with British members of parliament and take them to the Middle East. It's all declared in the members register of interest. We have one of the most expansive records in terms of what members of parliament of all parties, how they get hosted, their hospitality. And I think there are things we're not perfect, but part of the problem is perhaps that globally there's not a parallel level of, of information. Um, I think the issue is when do things be become malign and corrupt? Um, it is normal that the British government is going to listen to a foreign government if there is over £6 billion worth of contracts uh, up for discussion at a time when Brexit is going to, uh, in the views of many, do immeasurable harm to our economy. Of course the Prime Minister, he or she, is going to listen um, to people who will inevitably seek to advance their own interests if they've got got big business and big contracts to place, they will at the same time weave it into their own interests. But as long as we know about it, as long as it's out there, mm. that's the important thing. And that's why, you know, I do welcome today's report. OK, so, uh, David, at what point do you think the UAE's actions were malign and corrupt? Well, it seems to me the problem here is that we are all uh, trying to get to a position of saying that, yes, lobbying's a normal thing. We, what's wrong with it? Everyone does this. Well, it's not normal for, the, for vested interests to be able to secretly and covertly and not adequately transparently uh, pursue their interests. Now, let me just give one example of where this is a problem. The problem is that what, what this country was doing was encouraging racism and Islamophobia in this country for its own particular sectional interests back home. Now, that is where you've, where you've crossed the line. The idea that, that you can... 
Well, was yes, it? it was. I mean, the, 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 the inquiry it was requiring into the Muslim Brotherhood, the designation of, of our peaceful Muslim groups in this country as but being terrorists. That that we had their, their bank accounts closed from, down. from what the UAE was trying to do. It was it, trying that to wasn't denigrate the, unintended. the Muslim that Brotherhood, wasn't unintended. not Muslims they, as a whole. they designated those organisations as terrorists. Uh, well, they designated those organisations as terrorists. These are perfectly legal, peaceful uh, political organisations in this country. And it's part of a backlash mm. against Muslims being active in political life today, which, mean, which, which, result, which results in... Tommy Robinson supporters marauding in the streets uh, in central London and intimidating bus drivers when they're trying to go about their, their daily business. That's the result of it. And that's where, that, if you call that normal lobbying, I don't want any part of normal lobbying. Afsal, would you agree with that, that this lobbying resulted um, in, a, in, in, well, in a backlash against Muslims? I, I'm staggered. You see, I, I, I've been looking at um, terrorism uh, and uh, religious extremism since 1998. And Islamophobia is a horrible thing uh, and something that I've suffered from. But to suggest that this was the primary consequence, uh, I find very difficult to, to accept. Without this instance, we had Islamophobia, and I'm sure, uh, God forbid, we will continue to have it. I think the point here that uh, David just made, which I think is worth looking at, is the issue of transparency. Mm. Um, and I think uh, what constitutes um, uh, acceptable lobbying, um, I mean, I, I'm not defending lobbying. I'm just saying that is the currency of international relations. Now, if you want to change it, we have to change it internationally. Um, but in the meantime, we should have clear guidelines about when is lobbying acceptable and when it isn't. Uh, corruption, of course, is one of those, but uh, there are other things, values and laws. If any lobbying um, forces a go our government to take up uh, stances which affect our values, which affect our laws, then that is uh, a, a, an area for scrutiny, at least by parliament, if not by the public. And there is an issue here where security is uh, affected and intelligence is involved. In those instances, um, that very comprehensive recording of public meetings and public uh, act, uh, politicians' activities uh, may not be effective. But there are other mechanisms that we should perhaps bring into place, such mm. as the scrutiny of certain types of meetings, certain types of activities, certain types of lobbying by um, parliamentary um, select committees, suitably security cleared committees, or by other mechanisms. We have uh, scrutiny of our uh, intelligence services by independent cleared organisations. Okay. Let me just jump in on, on with that point. Kevin, you, you've got political lobbying in the title of your company. Do any of those sort of policings of lobbying exist? I mean, how do you, in your eyes, successfully and, uh, and, well, and lobby a politician? Uh, there are a number of things. It's about uh, how you tell a story about the consequence of a policy or a legislative objective. Increasingly these days you get the ear and attention of uh, politicians by mobilising <coughs> public opinion on a large scale, um, especially in the UK uh, currently with such a febrile uh, state in Parliament where the government uh, is governing, governing with a, um, a minority. Uh, and needs another political party from Northern Ireland to govern, you, there, are, there is lots of scope for change in Parliament, you know, some of it very progressive, based on the fact that the government is vulnerable to small swings in opinion. But lobbying works when you uh, tell a story, when you bring it to life with the, the, the economic consequences, the consequences of the human beings involved, the consequences of policy on the environment, and organisations, public sector, private sector, charities, pressure groups, all have an opportunity to make themselves heard. And, and increasingly, lobbying is more and more about mobilisation of large numbers of people and, and the digital age. Um, and I don't think we can ever be complacent at all about corruption and the principles behind reports such as this and, 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 and important groups. But it, it is now about how do you get politicians to act? And they act, whether they're left or right, if it's if they're encouraged to act in line with their values and those that put them in Parliament and what they are there supposedly to do. OK. David, how vulnerable are politicians to aggressive lobby lobbying? 
Well, I mean, I think the, the opposite is the case to what we've just heard. Really, the, what we've faced in the last 20 or 30 years is a process of, um, uh, of minimising the possibility of popular opinion on policy, which means that smaller and smaller groups are able to affect policy. And that's why it's so important that Cameron had the secret meetings or that Dean Godson of the policy exchange, uh, change think tank can secretly brief uh, David Cameron because he's his friend without it being disclosed. This is a narrowing and narrowing. It's a, a system which is institutionally corrupt, that lobbying is a, a form of institutional corruption uh, in politics. And so the question of, of politicians being vulnerable, yes, they're much more vulnerable than they were before, if one wants to uh, think of them in, in that way as being victims. But they are also, of course, Participants in this system, they get the money, they get the trips, they get the uh, sinecures after they leave office, they become advisors for the multinational companies, etc., etc. And so that's the real problem with, with, the, with our whole system of government. It's not a question just of, of breaking the law or, or of corruption in the sort of sense in which pe people are talking about. It's an institutionalised malaise inside policy making, which means that popular views are less and less listened to uh, by, by government. Right, and, okay. Unless, of course, you get a government which would be able to do to listen to them. OK, Afsal, um, just to pick up on that point, how influenced has the UK government been by the different actors in this Gulf crisis? Well, I don't know. I don't think there's a quantitative assessment of that. Um, but I think the point that's just been made is a very serious one, and it needs to be taken seriously. The claim is that um, uh, smaller and so smaller numbers of uh, single-interest groups are having greater influence than uh, the popular democratic mm. opinion. And if that is the case, it is a legitimate point of concern for a democratic society. And how do we manage that? Well, we manage that by looking at threats in an objective manner and holding politicians to account uh, and, and calling them out when we have evidence that they've done this. What we don't do is uh, come up with innuendo and claim that it doesn't hold up to scrutiny, even if it might be true. It needs to hold up to scrutiny to give credibility to the point uh, that the author has just made. Uh, and I think he's making a very serious and important point. But you can't make those points by uh, suggesting that um, uh, anybody who um, uh, criticizes or feels threatened by a political movement, such as the Muslim Brotherhood, is now uh, uh, causing Islamophobia. I'm sorry, but other politicians, both here in the UK and in the US, have caused more Islamophobic concern than the UAE's attempt to show their perspective. And it is a, a legitimate perspective from their point of view, and we may not agree with it, that is the Muslim Brotherhood has been embryonic uh, in terms of the extremist movements such as Al-Qaeda and others in the Middle East. That is a very uh, well-researched and a well-held point of view. Okay, so uh, if let me just jump in there because we are running out of time. We've got lobbying, about a minute left. We should be left, able David, to I can let see them do that. Shaking your head, but in a show about clandestine lobbying, many might legitimately ask who funds Spinwatch and whether Spinwatch has an agenda here. They may legitimately ask that, and that's why, of course, we publish on our website every organisation that gives us money. So uh, we, we are transparent about that, and we, we wish that other organisations that were engaged in this disp dispute and discussion were similarly transparent. The think tanks that we, we have looked at are not similarly transparent. They list some of the people who give them money, but they don't list all of them. So, uh, yes, we're happy to do that. I mean, the, key, the key thing here is that the Muslim Brotherhood is an organisation uh, which has many different uh, forms. There, are, there, is a, there is no threat from the Muslim Brotherhood in the UAE. There is a threat in the, uh, in the UAE, and indeed in other places like Saudi, from democratic reforms and that they have set their face against democratic reforms and that's why they're trying to what they're trying to defend here and the, the particular consequences yes of course it's not only the UEE which is causing Islamophobia in this country the government okay. The main, the, okay Kevin the, jump in we've got 20 seconds it, Kevin I, 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 as do other organizations 20 seconds David my very helpful suggestion David is very helpful suggestion get a hundred thousand what the Muslim Brotherhood, Brotherhood needs to do is get a hundred thousand people in the UK to sign an online petition in the House of Commons it will force a committee of MPs to analyze okay. and discuss the British government response to attempts to campaign by the UAE let's see if that can happen gentlemen it's been a fascinating discussion today thank you very much indeed for joining us Afzal Ashraf David Miller and Kevin Craig and thank you too very much for watching. You can see the programme again anytime by visiting our website at aljazeera.com.
And for further discussion, do go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Laura Kyle, and the whole team here, it's bye for now. <laughs>